Hello, thank you so much for joining me on The Same Drugs. I'm really happy that you were able to find the time. I'm really looking forward to talking with you. You're Canadian. Yeah. Um, and so presumably you've been following the situation with COVID and the mandate yeah. and yeah. the lockdowns and the rhetoric surrounding COVID and, you know, the vaccine mandates and so on and so forth. Mm. Um, I, I know you, you co-wrote a paper, which we'll get into in more detail about the unintended consequences of COVID vaccine yeah. policy. But I wonder if you can talk a little bit about I don't live in Canada anymore. I left um, and I do not wish to return. Mm -hmm. And of course, I've been following the news. Um, but I can you talk a little bit about what's going on right now with the mandates? Things have been changing, of course, semi recently. Yeah. I mean, would you like me just to jump into that right now? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so I, I live. Um, between Seattle and the Vancouver border on the on the west coast of the U.S., but I'm Canadian. I was born and raised in Montreal. I went to UBC as an undergraduate. Um, I have family just across the border, um, and so I've following, been following the Canadian situation. You know, for the pandemic, I spent a bunch of time in in Canada, also in in 2020, and went through quarantining and all that kind of stuff. So, I mean, my understanding right now is. We still the the federal mandates have been lifted in the sense that unvaccinated people can get on airplanes and, and trains and cross provinces. Um, but there still is a requirement if you come back into the country and you're unvaccinated, you have to quarantine for 14 days. Um, and there's sort of some other restrictions around that. I would say that there's still a lot of employees that have that they kind of created their own mandates. Um, and so there's still employee mandates in place. I would imagine that a lot of universities still have mandates, um, including, I know that some universities in Ontario are gonna be having booster mandates for their students in the fall. So requiring a third dose or else you're sort of disenrolled or I mean, depending on the university, you, have, you just kind of have this eclectic group of policies, right? Some places have exemptions, some allow testing instead of vaccination status, others don't, others don't have any mandates. Um, so it's sort of like a hodgepodge situation. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, the, the paper that you're referring to, right, we, we actually wrote that, um, we started writing it in December of 2021, but we put it out as a preprint just as the Freedom Convoy was starting in Canada. And although it's not a Canadian specific paper, I would say that we were pretty perceptive of the social pulse at the, at the time because we were anticipating political a political response, like a, a social response to mandates. And the Freedom Convoy was that. So it was quite um, a little um, yeah, un unnerving to sort of predict a social movement right before it happens. And of course, like there were, uh, it wasn't just in Canada, you had those types of protests around the world in all different countries. Um, it wasn't really covered very well in the media, I would say at all. Or when it was covered, it was um, you know, associated with far right movements and and sort of um, all sorts of negative connotations and symbolism around it. So um, I think the situation in Canada. I know that they that the the transport secretary has said, um, you know, we're not ditching these mandates; we're suspending them. Which mm -hmm. would, and and they are they're the current Trudeau government is in power at least for another couple of years, so they could conceivably bring back. Um, vaccine mandates for federal federal transport, um, you know, if they wanted to. I think a lot of provinces have sort of had enough of this. Um, but I think we still have a lot of institutions that still have these mandates in place. Yeah, I mean, the Quarantine Act is still in place, which apparently allows the government to do all sorts of irrational things and enforce all sorts of irrational rules. I saw a video online of a woman and her elderly father who had arrived to Canada and he didn't have a phone, so he didn't have the Arrive Can app. And, you know, the guy there was like, well, got to get the app. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. There's no, he's like, the, and she's, she's asking questions. She's like, why? And the guy doesn't really have any answers for her. And he's saying, well, maybe maybe he can use your phone to the woman. Right. And she's like, I don't want to do that. Why should I have to do that? And yeah. his response is, well, the Quarantine Act. Yeah. 
It's like, what does that mean? That just means you get to make arbitrary rules, I guess. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the ArriveCan app has been pretty controversial, I would say, you know, and I, I think the government has said now that they want to keep it permanent. I, I, there's, there's sort of a debate, right? Because I would imagine it makes some aspects of border control easier. You come like with a pre-checked file or, or whatnot, right? Right. And But there's all sorts of people that, you know, are excluded from this, like you're saying. The, and there's lots of videos of elderly people being confused by this, etc. Um, I've actually had the, the displeasure of experiencing a similar situation. So I don't have a cell phone. I, as a family, we gave up our cell phones a couple of years ago, which has been great because it means that I don't check Twitter when I'm out with my kids, right? Mm -hmm. um, but so we're, we, you know, I tried to go across the border and I didn't fill out the ArriveCan app. Um, I could have done it on my computer. But at this point, this was when mandates were lifting and I just thought that they wouldn't really be difficult about this. And I've actually crossed the border before and they didn't ask me about the ArriveCan app or anything. So I, I just didn't think anything of it. I took the kids up to see my um, their great, great grandparents and we were turned away at the border. Um, and this was just like on a Sunday. I thought, oh, let's go and see, you know, your great grandmother. Um, it, it actually, it was her birthday. So actually there was a sort of a party going on or whatever. And um, yeah, I, I stood there for a long time and I talked to an officer who was based in Ottawa. And I said, look, I don't have a cell phone. He didn't believe me. It was quite clear that he just thought I was not telling the truth. Mm -hmm. And I explained the situation and I said, um, you know, I'm a Canadian citizen. I would like to go across into Canada. And he said, well, we, you can go across to Canada, but we're going to give you a, I think it was three or $4,000 fine. And I, and I said, well, but that's not allowing free passage of a citizen into your own, into my country, right? Like you're, you're saying, oh yeah, you're free to go into Canada, but you're going to get a fine because le they legally can't deny you entry as a citizen into your own country. Yeah. So and I just thought that was really curious. Like I, I talked to the border guard for a while, trying to explain the circumstance and just being a reasonable human being and saying like, look, hey, this is why I didn't do it. Like, you know, we just going to go up there to see Oma for, for the for her birthday. And, um, you know, I have three kids. We've been waiting for two hours in the, in the hallway or whatever it was. Um, and he had no heart. Like he was just like, sorry, that's the rule. And I need to teach you a lesson. And even my attempt to say you're not you're this is you're not teaching me any lesson you're just telling you're just basically teaching me that you're a heartless bureaucrat um and and you're not you know i'm just going to be more upset with the canadian border service like you're not going to you know sort of bully me into this sort of passive state um and i try to explain like the consequences of that and he didn't he didn't care he said well i'm following my job whatever sorry mm -hmm. And I think that that's like, I've experienced a couple of instances of, of that. I've actually, for the pandemic, I spent time in France and Germany and Canada and the US. And in all of those instances, there were encounters with police officers, with public health authorities, with you know restaurant owners, other people who use the pandemic restrictions to just sort of have a hammer over you, it, where it was clearly just an arbitrary set of rules and there wasn't any public health benefit to that particular decision, right? Um, and that's worrying, like the proliferation of these rules and then the ability or the, um, the sort of um, tacit agreement that individuals can sort of police each other using these rules. This is sort of this mass sort of bullying effect. Um, so, yeah, I mean, sure, I didn't fill out the ArriveCan app, you know, if you you could say it's my fault. But I, I don't think I fundamentally actually think that we shouldn't have these have to uh, uh, fill out um, apps to um, get into uh, countries where we have citizenship. Like I, I just disagree with that as uh, for various reasons. So that's kind of a personal story. Well, yeah, I mean, and so I haven't gone back to Canada since last June. Um, and that was just before last June is in a, over a year ago now. Um, and that was, it was just before the vaccine mandates came into place. And I I haven't been back uh, partly because I don't want to participate. Like I don't I like I could get the Arrive Can app. I have a phone. I know how to use apps. <laughs> like yeah. it's not that complicated, but I I reject it and partly I reject it because I don't feel like 
other people should have to do that. Like, I don't think it's fair right. that somebody yeah. without a phone or somebody who's elderly and, or, and doesn't know how to use a phone or doesn't know how to apps, have use apps. Like my parents don't, wouldn't know how to use it. Like they don't have an iPhone. They have some old like flip phone that they probably use for emergencies. Like they wouldn't know how to do something like that. But when I say, when I'm critical about these things, some people will just say, oh, well, like you already have to, um, you already have to have like the proof of vaccine. Like you already have to do, go through this rigmarole to get into the country. Why not just do this also? Yeah. I mean, that's a, so I think most of us have those thoughts and it depends on your personality. Um, interestingly, like in my own family, my wife is more the one who's, who's really um, confrontational in that sense, right? My own personality is to be more um, more complicit and social and think, okay, well, these rules are being put into place for social better, better, betterment. And, you know, there's probably a reason why we should do this. So I, I tend to have this large part of me that's like trying to say, oh, you should just go along with things. Um, and I think we, we all have these different components of our own psyche, right, around compliance, uh, around rules that we don't think are useful. Um, but we're also living in a society that keeps on adding rules upon rules upon rules. Um, and Canada is a good example. I have a, a family member who is just applying for Canadian citizenship. And he, he said that he had to spend half a day filling out online paperwork about all sorts of strange details. And he's married to a Canadian. And he said they had to upload photos of before they were married, their engagement, he said it was an absolutely insane process of, of documentation that was needed. He's an American trying to become Canadian. And I just think that that's kind of a metaphor for the amount of bureaucracy that we're just allowing to constantly creep into our lives to the point that we spend so much of our time doing paperwork online, filling out forms, this and that, instead of spending time with our children, um, reading, thinking, and, and asserting our own sort of independent agency. So... I think yeah, you're you're right. I mean, for some people, there is a there's a value statement that needs to be made to resist what they see as arbitrary um, infringements of, in, in this case, state control and and surveillance. Really, I mean, um, yeah. As a thought experiment, one time I went into Canada and um, and I just wanted to sort of think, well, what would it be like if the government was really tracking you? And there's a lot of um, video cameras in Canada, a lot more than on this side of the border, right? Mm. And um, they're actually almost at every intersection. So the ability for the state surveillance apparatus to like follow people is astronomically large, right? So right now we have laws and regulations that prevent that. Um, but it's conceivable that in the foreseeable future in our lifetime that that surveillance apparatus is not used you know, under the checks and balances of the constitutional government. And, you know, you can say, oh, that's alarmist or whatever. Uh, I don't think so. I mean, if you look at what's happened in China during the pandemic with the COVID lockdowns and the use of the app system uh, related to uh, vaccine mandates and then also test status to basically um, uh, gatekeep people's uh, uh, internal movements and their, you know, access to bank accounts, access to jobs, et cetera. It's, it's quite scary. Um, a lot of people don't know about the social credit system in China. And obviously it's fragmented, like it's complex, it's a very complicated subject. But the goal is to have this kind of massive surveillance apparatus linked to personal behavior and ideological, um, you know, um, positions in society. So I think there's, yeah, there's a, a strong case to be made for people to object to you know that even though you can say okay the arrive can app is not that but it is one step in that potential direction well and i feel like it could easily become that which is i think what you're getting at i mean we've seen the way the canadian government has punished people who don't agree with government policy in yeah. very harsh ways i mean by you know forcing people into unemployment but mm -hmm. also by, you know, cutting them off from their bank accounts and yeah. cutting them off from, you know, things like PayPal and, right. and, you know, a lot of people, like if you're, 
independent than, or if you're fundraising, for example, then you're reliant on those kinds of payment platforms. You know, I am as an independent writer and podcaster. If I got cut off, I would have to figure out some other way to um, receive financial support and donations from my audience. Yeah. And yeah, I think I just, it's, it's what I wonder why people aren't concerned that this will never end. I suppose that it's just that they, they trust the government, but to me, it seems obvious that they can just continue and continue and continue. And where will they draw the line? I don't, I don't trust them to draw the line in an ethical place anymore. Yeah, I mean, the freezing of bank accounts for protesters is, was a pretty worrying development. Um, during the, the protests, I mean, I just thought that there were a lot of opportunities for de-escalation that were not taken. Um, I, I remember trying to think about this as the protests sort of started and, and listening to Justin Trudeau's rhetoric. And I just thought, this is the exact opposite of what uh, Canadian leaders should be doing, you know, it, creating this sort of um, us and them uh, dirty and un unclean rhetoric, um, you know, no matter what he personally thought of people who are not vaccinated, I mean, he clearly demonized a whole segment of the population and this really simplistic, narrow and myopic rhetoric. Um, and yeah, it was, it's really, it's, it's really strange. It's really odd, you know, Canada, um, growing up Canadian in Montreal in a very like, um, diverse community. Canada was this nation of tolerance, of expression, right? And, and of, of, yeah, sort of cultural diversity. And I just, um, it's worrying to see the way that the country has been going uh, for the last couple of years. Yeah. Well, and it's just, it's confusing, which, you know, could be seen as like a purpose of bureaucracy in some ways. You know, the other, it's like, I'm, I don't want to come back because I don't want to participate in this app system but i'm also like what does it mean to be vaccinated anymore you know i like yeah. they've they the government has said you know we're planning on changing the definition or we might be changing the definition i'm confused every time i look at the news of what it means to be fully vaccinated right yeah and they're not providing assurances to people like yourself who who are not wanting who are concerned that this system is going to be reintroduced and are feel uncomfortable with that. Mm -hmm. um, I wonder, so I, like, I want to talk about your, your paper, of course. Um, I wonder what were some of the, the consequences of COVID vaccine policy? What was it that you found in your paper in terms of impacts? Yeah. So, so the paper is, is um, structured as a set of hypotheses. So we did our best to draw together the studies that existed at the time that were published or that were preprint servers or whatnot. And then we related that to, uh, you know, media accounts, et cetera. But the whole, the group of authors, we've been following this obviously from the very beginning. I mean, I've been following COVID um, since January of 2020. I mean, before this, I was actively involved in, you know, conversations, academic and public health conversations about the role of social scientists in pandemic response, right? Um, and coming out of the Zika pan uh, uh, pandemic, um, I, I led a mosquito control program in Haiti um, during that, during 2016, 2017, and then Ebola before that in West Africa. So um, yeah, I was very involved in, in those sort of discussions. And a lot of that obviously involves trying to make make sure that public health takes into consideration like the capacities and then also the perspectives of, of people, right? And the diversity of a community and, and really tries to rather than impose um, public health restrictions, right? Um, tries to empower people to care for their own communities and to address epidemics in a way that is least disruptive, um, but also increases uh, trust between populations and public health authorities, government scientists, et cetera, et cetera. So there's this whole you know, rhetoric that we had pre-COVID about what we we're doing as a group of social scientists in this, you know, across universities and whatnot. And it's just been very uh, mind boggling to see how that then shifted with, with the pandemic. So um, 
a lot of these points are also relevant to like lockdowns and restrictions and the general ethos that the pandemic has taken, right? As a, as a sort of social crisis. And the way that I like to think about it is, um, I like to draw parallels between COVID and 9-11. Um, and, and the way that society responded to the terrorist attacks. And I actually was a 17-year-old, um, and I moved from Montreal to Boston two months before 9-11 um, happened. And my dad was actually flying from Boston to New York City that day, and I thought, wow, he might be on the plane. It was like quite a dramatic thing. And I just remember the shock of the country after that and sort of like the psychological process that took place. And it, it's very similar to what happened here. Like, you have one meta narrative, and dissent against that meta narrative is seen as, as very, very threatening. So I remember Howard Zinn, who's a very famous historian, right, wrote uh, People's History of the United States. He actually came to, to my high school, um, and his basic point to this group of you know, high school students was questioning what your government is doing is not anti American, right? And if we can remember that time, that period of history, that, that was the, the general like media narrative. You know, we, we have to go to war, we have to retaliate and don't question, you know, what, what the government is saying or else you're anti-American. And I think a comparable thing sort of took place here. If you're going to question, let's say, the social harms of lockdowns or the social harms of vaccine mandates, you're seen as, as a threat to the dominant narrative of, mm -hmm. you know, how society is understanding this crisis and responding to it. Um, and like, as a, as a researcher who, who I do research, social science research, but I, a lot of my research work is actually public health programs, right? And like my goal is to uh, make sure, you know, maximize disease control efforts so that it keeps people healthy, right? And I've worked on lots of different parasitic diseases, et cetera, in Africa and in Asia and elsewhere. Um, and like a principle of that is, you know, you don't use a hammer. And you also, you have to be honest with people and transparent. And I think that those are some elements that have not been been used. And I don't think that's always public health's fault. I think that the government and political forces have sort of, you know, they're intertwined here, the political politicalization of the response, right? It's not always just public health scientists who are actually communicating. Um, but it's been a bit, it's been a big, big process. So the paper outlines what we call unintended consequences. So that's been been a big focus of mine over the last year and a half is just trying to raise awareness and trying to crack a little bit that uh, at the narrative that you know maximum covid control efforts right um have these social externalities they affect society in negative ways and we need to be kind of trans we need to be transparent about that um so and that includes like uh, the effect of lockdowns let's say on um peasant farmers in rural africa or in haiti um, which has been really devastating. Um, you know, Oxfam has come up with reports saying that the pandemic might uh, be responsible for an additional 180 million people going into extreme poverty in 2022. Um, a lot of that. And then there's a lot of survey data showing that, like, that is because of lockdowns, restrictions, the sort of basically the sort of great, you know, pause that took place with the promise that it would control COVID and, and save lives. And I think um, it, in some ways, you know, it did, if you're going to reduce viral transmission, but then when you open up, you get that transmission anyways. So it's sort of delaying anyhow, that's a big conversation. Um, and so, yeah, that's, that's one of my big, um, efforts right now is just to raise awareness about the unintended consequences. Cause I think a lot of these policies, they weren't designed in ways that were trying to weigh the benefits and the harms. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean it was all it was all really strange because um there was a real there there was a real refusal I think to think long term and I don't understand right now why why the Canadian government is maintaining the vaccine mandates mm -hmm. to start because I think that there's things that we've learned yeah. over the past couple of years about this virus and about the vaccines that should have led the government to alter this blanket policy and yet they haven't really. Yeah, I mean, I think that there's actually, there is a lot of, 
where there was a lot of support for the vaccine mandate in Canada. Um, I, there was a recent survey released this, this week or last week that found a, that it's reduced significantly, right, over the last couple of months or, or weeks, uh, mostly because people have all gotten COVID vaccinated and unvaccinated, and they've gone through the illness. And I think there's a, there's a changing perception, you know, around what it means to be living with COVID now that we're two and a half years into this pandemic, which is, you know, um, at a certain point, we're not going to call it a pandemic anymore. Um, if it does go into seasonal patterns, then we'll talk about seasonal epidemics. Um, I think there's, we're at a weird moment right now. We're not really sure what's going to happen, right, with, with COVID, whether it's going to have sort of two epidemic bumps a year, whether it's going to go into sort of a seasonal pattern. Um, I don't know. It's confused. It's a, it's a little bit of an uncertain time. But I think in terms of the mandates themselves, I mean, it's clear that the Trudeau government has put a lot of political capital into that or political credibility. Um, you know, I think that they should have, um, uh, uh, you know, backtracked on it a lot earlier. Um, the Austrians sort of did the same thing, right? And Germans also, they, that was, I think, defeated in the parliament or it wasn't going to go through parliament. The Austrians are a weird example because they're, they announced uh, that they would have the first, you know, mandatory population-wide mandate, and this was in um, like late 2021. Um, and if you track that with the vaccine uptake, there's no increase when the mandate was announced that it would take place um, over the couple of months that it that it was in sort of in place. And then they they actually re they they stopped it right before the fines were supposed to go into 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 action so you were supposed to get fined a couple of hundred or, or whatever euros per month or some some such thing um if you weren't vaccinated um and you know they also locked down people who were unvaccinated so they had sort of a segregated lockdown for a period of time um and um yeah i, I mean i think that there's there's my sense is that like the increase and we say this this in the paper like Studies are not showing a, a massive increase when you when you when these passports and mandates were introduced. Um, you do have an increase because if you say, "Hey, you're not going to have a job if you're if you if you're not vaccinated," like people will get vaccinated, right? Um, you will have, and this again goes down to sort of personality traits. You will have people who will become much more resistant simply because you're telling them to do something, um, and. And then you have this sort of like spectrum of responses depending on personality. But um, uh, the studies that are that we reviewed in this paper that were available at the time showed basically you had a, the largest increase in younger people. And we know that younger people are less at risk from severe COVID outcomes, right? So you're essentially creating a mandate with, you know, increasing uptake in the lowest risk groups. And I just think considering the way that society has responded to these mandates and like the, the, the sort of effects that I really question whether it was worth it. Yeah, I mean, I think it's not a good way to build trust because as you said, I think that when people are told you have to, and I'm this kind of person, um, I'm, you know, resistant to authority. I'm certainly resistant and questioning of rules that don't make sense to me. Or if somebody won't explain to me why, mm -hmm. then I'm like, I don't want to do it, you know, and I've never questioned any vaccine before. Now I'm much more likely to, <laughs> to be honest, because right. of what's happened in this situation. Yeah. Um, I, I wonder, have there been other situations anywhere ever where a vaccine has been mandated? Well, we have lots of vaccine mandates, right, in schools. Um, and some healthcare facilities have, or most healthcare facilities have mandates also for their employees. Um, so those are like two areas where we, we have historical examples of mandates. So a lot of people who are pro-mandate, like ethicists or other people in the academic world that, um, you know, would, would argue against my position would say, well, we have these, we have a precedent for mandates, right? Um, and then you get into the nitty gritties of like notions of proportionality or uh, benefits and these different ethical sort of um, concepts to say, well, when do you impose uh, restrictions on an individual's liberty or decision making, right, for the greater good of the of the community? And they'll say, well, we have seatbelts, we have taxes, we have 
all these sort of border controls. We have a lot of rules and regulations that do restrict liberty on an individual basis, right? The question is whether this particular vaccine at this particular time, like, fulfills those criteria, right? And so, like, and we we do outline this in the paper. If if the vaccine was more sterilizing or sterilizing fully, like it stopped transmission, so you got vaccinated and you were never really going to get COVID and you weren't really going to pass it on, right? Um, that that would provide a strong like ethical basis, you could argue, for a mandate, right? Because you're going to protect other people, and that was the original like uh, reasoning that you know President Biden and other people stood up and said. You know, it's 95% effective. If you, you get vaccinated, you're not going to get COVID uh, and et cetera. And so then we kind of took that logic and we kept on applying it, not realizing that evidence that was coming in was contradicting that from quite an early period of time. And actually, I, I do wonder like how much Pfizer and other pharmaceutical companies knew at the very beginning when the clinical trials were out, when they were doing research, how sterilizing that was going to be. And my hunch is that there was, there was certainly like a large conversation about it and a sense that, look, this is probably not going to stop transmission as much as we're hoping, but we had a lot of hope. So it almost feels like that hope, you know, kind of led the pace for the, for mandates and passports, you know, and, and, but then you get into situations where people are denied all of these, you know, regular aspects of, of life and, um, for a basis that's not really strong, right? So like people, tons of individuals have reached out to me like with their story of being fired. Yeah, a lot of those people had COVID, right? Before a mandate went into place in their workplace. And then they would say, well, look, I already had COVID. Why are you denying the, the, this basis of natural immunity or, or whatnot? Um, I mean, we also know now, like, I mean, we, we, this is also kind of apparent in the conversation, like, you're going to get COVID lots of times. It's not like you even, you get COVID and you're not going to get COVID in the, again, right? It's like we're living with this virus and you're going to constantly be exposed to it. Um, so yeah, that's part of the, the challenge. I think people, you know, and people who have been in decision-making places, like they faced a lot of difficulties. Like this has been difficult. And I think it's, it's important to realize that there are humans um, and that they're, you know, trying to make decisions that they think are, best. I like to give people the benefit of the doubt. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I would hope so. I mean, I tend not to take the route where I'm assuming that right. somebody has evil intentions. Yeah. Um, sometimes, I mean, it's clear that there's political and, you know, probably financial incentives at play in various areas. But I mean, I I'm not going to speculate about what's happening there. I I mean, I want to talk about the impact of the lockdowns particularly because I think early on a lot of people who express concerns and criticisms about yeah. the lockdowns, you know, they a lot of those things that they were worried about came to fruition. Right. Um and I actually saw that you tweeted um a couple days ago, an article from BBC News that showed mysterious liver problems in kids linked to immunity debt. Right. Um, you can probably explain what that term means because I don't know, caused by COVID restrictions. Um, and and uh, yeah, I mean, talk about what, what happened there, first of all. Yeah, I mean, so that's an idea that, um, so we, we have all these sorts of um, circulating like childhood viruses or just viruses in general that are constantly circulating in the human ecosystem, the human community, right? And we're building some degree of immunity to that every year as we get infected with colds or we get the influenza virus or we get, um, you know, these different childhood viruses. So the, the lockdowns stopped that the transmission, not only of COVID, right? It also reduced the transmission of these other seasonal coronaviruses and other viruses, et cetera. And, and that's constantly stimulating our immune system, right? Especially for young children. And there's lots of different ideas around like the significance of that for the developing immune system. So one way to think about this also, a lot of people are probably familiar with like with the hygiene hypothesis, right? Which is the idea that humans evolved in nature, um, you know, getting dirty in the soil and not in the sterilized um, you know, home environment that we 
that we raise our kids in now. And a lot of the autoimmune conditions, this is the idea, are like related to the fact that we don't have an exposure to viruses and dirt and other things on a regular basis from a young age anymore. Um, so that's with the with the uh, this sort of mysterious liver um, condition. It seems like that's the conclusion that these UK researchers are, are drawing. And there's been like lots of debate about this for a while. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, there's been some really interesting research on like the potential effect on kids' microbiomes, right? Having been isolated from each other for two years or whatnot. Um, and that's just like the tip of the iceberg, right? And um, when you go down the effects, the potential like effects of, of lockdowns, um, but, yeah. Yeah, I mean, the the health impact, I mean, in this particular context, in any case, because I, we can also talk about other health impacts and mental health and so on and so forth, was interesting to me because I know, and I think lots of people know, that it's actually important to be exposed to germs right. and to other people. And, you know, I grew up playing outside in the dirt and in sandboxes full of pee, I'm sure. And, um, you know, I, I was really worried about these kids who were young and growing up in this situation where they were being protected from any germ at all. And not just being protected from any germ at all, which like, it's like kids, that's when you're developing your immune system, as I understand it, is when you're young, like in particular, I think you probably need to continue to expose yourself to life throughout your life. But um, you know, and there being like all this um antiseptic, what is, like why can't I think of this word right now? Like yeah. I'm still regularly offered when I I mean I live in a small town in Mexico, so not here, but when I travel outside of this town, even you know, when I travel to places like Mexico City or yeah. like Puerto Vallarta or places in the US, for example, people offer you hand sanitizer and I always say, No, thank you, and they don't push it, thank goodness. But I'm like, yeah. I this is I think it's been really bad for people, especially kids, for two years to be constantly, you know, not exposed to anything, but then sanitizing all the time to that yeah. extent. Yeah, well, we're going to see the concept, you know, it's like a massive natural experiment on humans. We've never, like, sort of isolated ourselves quite like that in the modern world. Um, and also, like, with face masks, with young kids, um, I mean, my own son, he has apraxia, right? So he has a speech problem. Um, the therapist, they were all basically closed for two years. Um, and when I've spoken to them about like the backlog of people uh, that are like kids having speech problems, it's massive. And mm. um, that's just one little small area. And I've talked to other public health folks, specifically one um, gentleman, a professor uh, from Europe, I remember him being very upset about the impact of masking kids because his, I think his, his daughter had a speech problem or, you know, um, like a, sort of a phobia around masks and just sort of the way that they were treated. Um, I know a lot of schools, even in the local area here, um, if you actually had a medical um, exemption for masks, you couldn't actually go to the school. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there's... Yeah, there's a lot of different impacts, right? When you start to impose rules and restrictions, and this gets back to the to the pre-COVID, there was this sort of acceptance in public health. Well, there was there's lots of different forces here, but one of them, one of the major thinkings was during a pandemic or an epidemic or a health emergency, you actually try to disrupt society as little as possible, because the disruption of society has it creates like a second wave of consequences. You have like the health emergency and then you have the fear, the, the panic and the way that that rolls in, you know, socially. Um, and there's a great body of literature about like scapegoating people during a pandemic, right? A certain class of people are seen as like the, the reason for why this is so bad and they're sort of seen as the scapegoat. Um, in this case, I would say that the unvaccinated became a sort of scapegoating class in Canada and, and elsewhere. So that sort of group anger was directed at them. And for a while, they were accused of like, the reason that there's the pandemic is, is continuing is because of these unvaccinated people. And there was even a couple of papers published suggesting that they're going to be leading to new variants because they're unvaccinated and it's going to perpetuate like 
you know, uh, this sort of never ending pandemic. It's the unvaccinated that are the, the, that are the reason that we're in this, these lockdowns, right? Um, so, so there was this strain of thinking saying, look, well, we need to try to limit disruption, right? And like school closures, you know, don't do them, do them as a last resort. Um, you know, there was skepticism about the actual effectiveness of masks, um, at least surgeon, surgical masks and especially cloth masks. Um, you know, lockdowns were not considered something that were, was feasible uh, and even desirable. But then yet we kind of threw that rule book out um, with COVID and we sort of went all in for maximum disruption. Um, and I would argue that part of that was also that people in public health and government have been anticipating a pandemic, a devastating pandemic for a long time. Um, and in those scenarios, like the, the fatality rate is higher than it is with COVID, or at least it's, it's not just the, uh, you know, skewed according to age and comorbidity. So mm -hmm. I would say, and like, if you think about it in popular culture, we have tons of these pandemic movies, like zombie movies, or the whole world is like, Obliterate all of humanity is obliterated with some pandemic that destroys like you know most of humanity and and those movies have they have public health people in hazmat suits next to military right so there's this close association in those circumstances and that's why we talk about biosecurity um, you know so global biosecurity and there's this close relationship between yeah the military response and in, in in, criti in critiques of that, we talk about, you know, the militarization of public health as a bad thing. And there's a huge amount of academic literature about, about this, about the way that it backfires um, and the, the fears around, around this type of response. So, yeah. I, can you tell me what, what a pandemic is and whether or not you think that COVID over the past couple of years constituted a, a pandemic? Yeah, so I mean, these terms are used differently, but the best way to think about it is like an outbreak is a is a, is a spread of an infectious disease in a, like a small little area, or at least with within a small social group. And an epidemic is when it gets to be larger and it's spreading, you know, uh, outside of a specific group or or a geographical area. And then a pandemic is just the spread of the virus multiple in multiple countries around the world at the same time. And so did COVID constitute a pandemic? Yeah, I would say that it did. Uh, it certainly fit that the criteria for it. Mm -hmm. um, I, so I wonder, I mean, I, I asked the question I'm sincerely because I want to know what constitutes a pandemic, but I suppose I feel frustrated sometimes when, well, sometimes, often, <laughs> um, when, people are talking about the impacts of the lockdowns um, and the mandates, and they talk about it in terms of because of the pandemic, because of COVID, because of the virus, mm. when in fact, it seems to me that it would be more accurate to talk about these impacts in terms of because of the lockdowns or because of the mandates, you know, when we're talking about economic impacts or health impacts even, um, including, you know, mental health impacts, including, you know, things like the rates of overdoses rising exponentially, for example. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, that's a, that's a really challenging question, in fact, right, is how do you, dis how do you disentangle the effects of, like, on mental health, for example, of a pandemic versus the pandemic measures themselves? Um, because you can imagine for some people, like the fear of, of, of the virus will have be, will be a significant driver of anxiety, right? Um, and in fact, this is one of the things that's really quite curious. And, and one of the arguments against lockdowns is if you look at like social mobility data, for example, that we actually get by phone tracking devices and, and whatnot, um, so following people's phones, uh, uh, in many countries, like, before you actually had government lockdowns or restrictions, Mobility drops significantly in like a week before because people are not stupid. If they're listening to the media or listening to their neighbors or whatever, and there's a lot of discussion about, about a, a virus spreading, right? And they're concerned about it. Like they will take measures into their own hands. They'll limit their own social interactions to try to reasonably take care of themselves. So there's a, an interesting conversation there about like how much people adapt their own behavior to fit their own risk their own understanding of risk 
And then the need for the government to actually say, no, we're going to mandate and we're going to create these laws that are going to penalize people. Um, and I think there's a strong case to be made that people actually do and, and this have like reasonably responded to the, to the pandemic within the, with, you know, an understanding of risk for themselves. Right. And I suppose I, I don't think I probably explained myself as well as I could have, but I suppose in, in terms of my wondering or questioning about the term pandemic, part of that also is because pandemic instills fear. So it does sound, it's scary. You know, yeah. if you say pandemic, people are going to get scared and that, that fear isn't just going to be around getting sick because everybody gets sick. We all get colds, we get yeah. the flu and so on and so forth. It's going to be around death. And so because of that association, I suppose I personally have tried to avoid using the term pandemic over the past you know, a year or so, because I think it creates an impression or an idea in people's head that I wasn't sure was necessarily suitable, um, because I didn't think everybody needed to be afraid of COVID. I thought that some people needed to be concerned about COVID. Um, right. But I thought that, you know, most people, particularly people who are under 40, particularly young people, particularly yeah. kids, you know, healthy people didn't really need to fear getting COVID. Hmm. I mean, I think that's a valid point. And, um, you know, when we're constantly talking in this language of emergency and, and a language of exceptionalism, right, it does create a lot of anxiety in people. Um, and in fact, we have, we're kind of like, littered with this narrative right now sort of this apocalyptic narrative that society is going down this road um that is you know very dark um the future is uncertain there's a lot of these sort of forces that are um that are at work that um, we don't fully understand and a lot of people don't actually have optimism about the future which is strange right in our in our generation people are not having kids saying well you know because of the climate crisis i'm not going to have children so the understanding of like the future in that sense or the present, yeah, it has a profound effect and fear has a profound effect on people. Right. So, um, yeah, I think that's, that's a, that's a valid concern. Right. And I would say that at, at early on in the, in the, in the pandemic, and I'll use that term, uh, around May of 2020, I think at that point we had a good opportunity for public health authorities and government to dial down the fear the fear barometer and we didn't do that we kind of kept going and kept finding reasons to create more uh, fear in the media cycle about covid rather than trying to say like look this is a serious virus but we're we have you know these these sort of strategies that we're using to try to mini, mini, mitigate it um and it's like the opposite sort of occurred i'm curious to know if in your research you found anything in terms of well, anything significant or concerning in terms of mental health impacts and, and the lockdowns and the mandates and the response in general to COVID? Yeah, that's a, so thanks for the question. I'm actually looking at the studies on mental health right now for a, a report. And um, there's a lot of them. There's a lot of study, like in, 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 in many ways, like this was one of the most recorded events of human history, right? You had because just of the way that we, um, the amount of information that we have, the information technology and, and um, size of our human population. So we have hundreds and hundreds of studies on mental health impacts during the pandemic. And I would say that they overwhelmingly show a lot of negative impacts, especially for younger people, um, but also the you know, elderly folks who were locked in nursing homes, um, not given access to family um, know family or nursing staff um it's um uh yeah i mean people who had pre-existing mental uh, health disorders or illnesses they were also incredibly impacted you could imagine somebody with obsessive compulsive disorder for example uh during the pandemic right talk about hygiene uh, obsession i mean um i've worked with kids with ocd and autism um when i was younger i mean i i and I've talked to care, carers uh, during the pandemic, and I think it's been really, really hard for people because of that fear factor, right? They, 
obsessing about COVID, about washing their hands, about this, about that. So, um, and then and then there's also like a, a, a you know class of people who are who don't agree with the political decisions that have been taking place, and they also have their own impacts. Um, you know whether you want to call that mental health or whatnot, but um, you know we we outlawed protesting, for example, in Canada during a lot of the lockdowns, uh, stay at home orders. You were not allowed to voice dissent, um, or you could be fined or imprisoned. Um, you know, we, we really, really created a heavy handed state of exception. Um, and yeah, the, the, the wow. epidemiological data is not as strong as we would hope it would be. Like we would hope that after so much, uh, you know, government mandates, restrictions, changing rules. I mean, the rule changing has been incredibly complicated, like rules changing almost weekly, you know, depending on where you were. And I, I think hopefully we seem to be at the tail end right now of this and we seem to be moving out of it. Um, but at the peak, massive amounts of rules, uncertainty, confusion. And yeah, I think that that, um, that really has left a, a psychological scar on, on people, a sort of sense of trauma or um, betrayal, confusion, um, and it's sort of a little, a little bit, it's inserted itself in this larger like identity crisis, I think, that we have as a society. Yeah, I mean, just the fact of being ostracized or cast out or vilified by friends and family because you, you know, had a different view than they did about the mandates and the lockdowns, I think, probably was quite traumatic for a lot of people. Yeah, I mean, people were, uh, we were told that if you had unvaccinated family members that you shouldn't invite them to Christmas. Yeah, and I mean, people went along, which would be so hurtful. So, I mean, if you think about it, also, we, we're projecting a very specific, like, philosophical uh, value system on that. Because if you're a, um, a, a strongly believing Christian, Christmas is a very significant event, and you have this sort of, afterlife that you're looking forward to and it's a completely different mental model than a secular government is working from which is this sort of um technological paradigm right and um and yet we have this we uphold the principles of religious freedom etc but um the infringement that sort of took place i think yeah it, people interpreted that in very different ways and in canada a lot of individuals that I saw speaking out the, the, the loudest were those from Eastern Europe. So who had experienced communism and, um, you know, they felt that quite viscerally, um, that sort of past and, and, and feeling like, are we going, is Canada going that direction now where we can't say what we really believe and we can't meet with people in our church and we can't meet with our family in our house. Um, you know, it, that, that brought up a lot of past you know, memories and trauma for people and also fear that that's the direction that society is sort of heading to. Um, so yeah, I mean, society is so complicated and people have such different lived experiences and perceptions. Um, and uh, yeah, I hope that we can sort of come out of this with, I don't know, a, a reinvigorated democracy to some degree. That's my hope. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it's funny because it's like there were two different narratives. There are probably more than two different narratives, but there, in, in terms of in terms of class, there were very different narratives in terms of what people were experiencing and expecting, and what was reported and told in the media on that basis. You know, I think that for Canadians and I noticed this particularly when I left Canada because what I was seeing and experiencing in real life was so drastically different than what my friends in Canada thought was going on, right. mostly because they were very isolated. So they were all still locked down and they weren't out in the world engaging with real people. And the yeah. people that they were engaging with, mostly online, but maybe a few in real life, were people really just like them so they're thinking everybody's at home everybody's working at home yeah. everyone's or they're not working and they're on serb or whatever um 
And this is just what everyone's doing. And, you know, I think that some people were kind of shocked to the point of disbelief to learn that not everybody was doing that. And I think it really demonstrated a class difference, Mm -hmm. you know, primarily, but also really just, just how, how isolated Canadians are in terms of what they understand about the world around them. Yeah, I mean, certainly people have experienced it, this the last two and a half years in very, very different ways. And one of the arguments that I think is quite compelling is that the, the lockdowns um, serve to protect people that were higher income and middle income, but low, people on the lower end of the socioeconomic ladder, they still had to deliver packages, you know, go to meat factories and do their daily job. And so there was this sort of strange protective effect for those who were wealthy enough to sort of self-isolate. But I think a lot of people ended up being feeling like they're in these glass um, castles of isolation, right? Like maybe the lockdowns and restrictions were fun for a certain period of time. But after a while, I think even individuals who were wealthy started to feel fundamentally lonely. Um, And there was a lot of, you know, existential questions about, about that that sort of rose out of that so yeah so it, did you find that there were any positive impacts or effects of the the lockdowns and mandates did it help at all in terms of curbing the virus or keeping people safe or anything yeah, yeah i mean this is important to point out like yeah there's lots of studies showing that there are positive impacts if you're thinking about things in terms of restricting the spread of the virus um, you know, if you're going to close down uh, and, and restrict human movement, you are going to stop the transmission of a respiratory virus for a certain period of time, depending on how many people are actually listening to those rules. Um, but there's a lot of complexity there. So if you, for example, just as one example, one sort of um, example to pick, if a country says, okay, we're going to have a lockdown, right? Let's say, in, and there's a couple of studies from India, for example, suggesting this, showing this. Okay, general lockdown in one day, tomorrow, right? Everyone's going to then move back to their home villages or their home communities. So in some ways, you're actually facilitating the spread of the virus um, to, you know, to rural remote areas. If everyone thinks, okay, we're going to be in lockdown, I don't know, uh, picking India as an example, I don't know what's going to happen. Maybe we're in this for three, four months, I have no idea. So I'm going to go back to my rural village where I have, you know, food security or whatnot. I don't want to stay in the city. But then they're actually spreading the virus out to those areas. So there is like considerations about spatial movement when you do that. Um, And obviously, like Australia and New Zealand are good examples of island countries that had very strict border regulations, very strict lockdowns, and they had no COVID mortality for huge periods of time in 2020, 2021. Um, But now since they've opened up, right, and even with vaccination, you, you do now have a rising mortality rate amongst vulnerable people that sort of groups that you th- that are most impacted by COVID. So I think there's probably some countries that are going to look back and think, oh yeah, we did the, the we did the correct uh, approach. Like I think Australia and New Zealand are probably going to f- feel like that. But then you also have Sweden, which is a great example of a, a much more measured, uh, what I would say is a classic, like following that pre 2020 pandemic influenza plan, which was, as I said, like not disrupting society, trying to focus on the most vulnerable segments of, of the population. But even then, they had their own problems, not protecting nursing homes enough early on during the pandemic. Um, but they, for the most part, had kept things open, right? They didn't have lockdowns. Um, they had limited effects on schools. And um, other Scandinavian countries kind of followed that too. So such a like variety of countries. So you can kind of pick and you can pick, like, if you're pro-lockdown or you're pro-mandate, you can sort of certainly find some examples to illustrate your point. But I think on the whole, um, I don't, I'm not very convinced that, certainly when you can consider the harms, um, that it was, a lot of the policies were, were worth it. Sometimes when I <clears throat> am speaking critically about the lockdowns or the mandates to people who were in support of the lockdown and the mandates, they'll say, you know, like, well, what should we have done? Just let everybody die. Just let COVID run rampant. 
I'm curious to know what you think should have been done. What should the response have been? I mean, that's a great question. Um, depends on what time period we're talking about. Um, and I think there was certainly the early lockdowns in 2020 were a reasonable ish response to like having a virus that you were uncertain about. We didn't have tests that were accurate. Um, you know, there was a lot of uncertainty. So an initial sort of lockdown justified on, um, trying to prepare or get a sense of how, you know, trying to backtrack and get a plan would be worth it. Um, I think that there could have been a lot more done for um, nursing homes and for vulnerable people groups, right? To, to reach out and, and do much more concerted um, uh, capacity building with them, uh, with, with nursing home staff, right? So this is sort of the focus protection um, stance, uh, the Great Barrington Declaration. And, you know, I might agree with certain elements of that and, and not, not with others. And I don't think that there is a perfect solution. That's kind of what I would say. Um, this, there, perfection in some ways is the enemy of the good in, in this circumstance. And I think that's what we've seen with, the, with those negative consequences that we're sort of talking about. Um, I also was surprised to see a lack of um, efforts at supportive treatment. Um, so like if you had COVID, you were told to just go home and then go to the emergency room if you couldn't breathe. That was like the extent of medical care. And, you know, um, we knew early on, like anti-steroids could help some people, certainly antibiotics, once the infection got into the chest, it could play a role. There was, and there were a lot of different doctors trying different treatments, you know, um, and I, it felt like that was really sidelined. And I've talked to a lot of doctors who've been quite frustrated with that. There was no like hotline that you could call saying, you know, I'm starting to feel like I have a chest infection. Can I get some antibiotics? Um, that, that seems to have not been a big priority, at least in the conversations that I've had. Um, yeah. And um, certainly once we had testing, right, then you could, uh, we could have implemented more like rigorous testing for those vulnerable groups of people in nursing homes and specifically. Obviously, like a lot of transmission also occurs in the hospital, which is called a nosocomial infection, right? So the spreading within hospitals. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, I could probably go on. I would need time to think about, I haven't actually been asked that question for a while. So. <laughs> well, I appreciate your answer and your efforts to answer because I mean, my response is, I'm genuinely curious, of course, and my responses have been sort of vague. I mean, I know that the the lockdowns were harmful, and I know that vulnerable people should have been protected more, but um, in terms of the spe specifics, it's hard for me to articulate that in any case. It's not my area of expertise. Um, I Finally, I'll, I'll let you go soon. Thanks for your time. I appreciate it. I'm, I'm curious to know what the response was to your paper. Yeah, it's a great question. I think we've, um, I've been, yeah, uh, people that would, I guess, be classified as more conservative have reached out to me and, and said, thanks for your paper. Um, this is exactly my sort of assessment of the situation or how people have been um, discussing this issue. Um, and uh, apart from, I've had a couple of podcasts but in terms of like outreach to mainstream media sources, there hasn't been much interest at all. And um, within the public health community, um, I haven't got a huge amount of comments from colleagues, et cetera, despite the fact that the author, the co-authors on the, on the paper, I mean, we are relatively pretty respected public health researchers. And uh, the, the aim also was to open up a conversation about, about these, uh, the social effects of these policies, right? So. I'm hoping that it that that the conversation gets more traction going forward as people sort of reflect back on what took place. Um, so yeah, and I mean a lot of emails from individuals who have you know lost their jobs and um, had to deal with the consequences that are described in the paper. 
Um, and yeah, the occasional email from, from folks working in public health departments around the world saying thanks a lot for that. I agree with your perception or your, your analysis of it, of, of what's taking place. So I think, well, well, we'll see where it goes from here. Yeah. Well, um, thank you for the paper. I found it very informative and interesting and it's important. And um, I really appreciate that, you know, people are looking into this. Um, and I hope that the paper gets a lot of traction. And thank you so much for talking with me today. This was really interesting. I really appreciate that you were able to make the time and I learned a lot. So thank you. Thanks so much for having me. Uh, and uh, look, look forward to talking to you in the future. Okay, great. Take care. Have a good night. Bye. Bye.